Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Grant's Interest Rate Observer podcast. I am Jim Grant, and uh, this broadcast is coming to you from the uh, broadcasting tower at 2 Wall Street, which happens to be a slightly um, gloomy conference room. It's not really a tower exactly, but it's, uh, it's where we broadcast, and um, it's nice to have you with us. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Pitney Bowes, by the Pitney Bowes SendPro. Did you know that uh, compared to Stamps.com, SendPro has three times the features at one-third the price? Well, it's true. You can print stamps at your computer. Just call it the Internet of Stamps. Uh, you can, if you like, continue to wait in line at the post office. Uh, you don't have to. No special equipment required. You can print paid shipping labels for uh, the U.S. Postal Service, UPS, and more. You can track your shipments, too, from that same easy-to-use interface. Uh, you can save money. Pitney Bowes has negotiated special rates for Send Pro users, with savings beginning at uh, three cents per stamp. So, want to learn more? Well, visit pb.com/grantspod to find out about an introductory offer that features 90 free days of Send Pro, along with what the Pitney Bowes people describe as a free 10-pound scale, by which I think they mean a free scale that registers weights up to 10 pounds. Well, let me know when you receive your scale. Uh, thank you, Pitney Bowes. That's uh, pb.com slash grantspod to find out more. With me today is, uh, is the great Evan Lorenz, deputy editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. Eric Whitehead is on the controls. And our special guest is, uh, is Jim Bianco, who uh, is the eponym and the founder of Bianco Research and is connected as well intimately with Arbor Trading. And, um, I don't know, has been um, telling people what they ought to know about the bond market uh, since about the year 1990. That was just about the time of the invention of the bond market, a long time ago. Jim, welcome to you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and, and you are, if memory serves, you are in the great state of Illinois and in the even greater city of Chicago. Is that not correct? That is correct. And uh, tell us, Jim, uh, is it not true that, uh, not to point fingers or get this off on a contentious note, but isn't it true that everything around you is going broke? I mean, everything municipal. It seems to be in that uh, mode right now, both the state of Illinois bonds, city of Chicago bonds, Chicago public school bonds are all, you know, in that line from uh, the Sun Also Rises, Ernest Hemingway's book, how does one go bankrupt slowly, then suddenly, and we're very close to the end suddenly portion of that process. And we've been in the slowly portion for about two decades right now. Where is the highest yield among the issuers you just named, Jim? Uh, the highest issue yield is probably among the um, Chicago Public School District. That is probably in the weakest position of all of them. And when I say the weakest position, I think a lot of people should understand the fundamental problem here. In 1970, Illinois passed the Constitution, and in the Constitution it said that it is constitutional law in Illinois that if you sign an agreement with a union, you cannot change it. So we signed these lavish agreements with the unions for pensions, and we cannot change these pensions. After 20 years, in your 40s, you can retire and you could make 90% of your salary for the next 30 years, so we're paying tens of thousands of people nearly what they were getting paid to work for the state or the city or the Chicago Public School District to not work for them. Compound on that, that the way that they've been trying to fix this problem is to raise taxes and raise fees, they've been driving people out of the state. So every year, Chicago leads the list of people leaving the city, and Illinois leads the list of people leaving the state. So we have less taxpayers every year. That is the vicious cycle that this state is caught in right now. And unless there is a constitutional convention to change those parameters on some of those pension plans, which is nearly impossible. It's like the national one. You need two-thirds of a vote, and we are a split, uh, um, we are a split house, uh, a state house right now. It, it doesn't look like there's any solution in sight. What is the highest yield on these security? You mentioned Chicago public schools are perhaps the most precarious credit. Are these a 5% number, a 6% oh, number? Or? Try nine, eight and three quarters, and that's tax-free. Uh, that was just issued last month. Is that prin principal? Th is that principal free as well to the investor? <laughs> it might be <laughs> at some point, but right now the cash flow numbers, at least the Excel spreadsheet, says that you're getting nine and three quarters tax, uh, eight and three quarters, excuse me, tax free. Are you a buyer or a seller? Well, you know, um, 
if you could uh, suspend belief and think that there's actually a two-way market for these things, that uh, Illinois has payment prioritization. That's why we have something like $13 trillion of vendors in the state that have not been paid. And the belief is the, if any money comes into the state, and some money will always come into the state no matter how bad it comes, the first dollar will go to pay debt. So for the foreseeable future, the next several months or year or so, you're probably going to continue to get that cash flow. But over the long term, with all these retirees that can get paid and with everybody leaving the state and with the tax burden continuing to go up, uh, I think over the long term, unless there's some radical change, that uh, you're going to have a problem with getting your principal back. How's that for a diplomatic answer? Well, I think that the mayor of Chicago is going to commend you on this, Jim. Hey, um, let's uh, talk a little about the, the national scene. I know Evan has a couple of questions, and, and so do I. I wanted to ask you first, Jim, about the yield curve. You know, it seems a more or less predictable feature of every tightening cycle that the curve will tend to flatten, uh, short rates and long rates coming closer together. But uh, ordinarily, and except for the, the previous tightening cycle, that occurred with the prices of long-dated securities falling and their yields rising to meet the rising short rates, and yet this time it seems to be not happening. What, what, what's different about this time, and what does that difference tell you about the state of the government securities market, and indeed about the economy? Well, the big difference this time around is we could probably spend the rest of this podcast talking about whether or not we actually have a freely traded bond market. Oh, no, we, and, we, can, we can dispose of that right away. We, we don't. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that there, therein lies the problem. It just... Uh, for one statistic for the, the listeners, the Central Bank of China, the Central Bank of Japan, the Federal Reserve itself, which is the largest, and commercial banks, which take their cue from the Federal Reserve, those four groups, that's half the U.S. Treasury market right there. That's half of it right there. And they all t- seem to move in lockstep in a way where they set these prices almost by committee. Uh, and so it, it, one step, I think that the problem with the bond market is, is that it is under the, the auspice of the central banks led by the, uh, the, the Federal Reserve. If you wanted to then peel that back a little bit and say, what's going on with the bond market right now is there's, the Fed is raising rates. The Fed is making noise about reducing its balance sheet. We'll see what they wind up doing if they wind up doing anything. And at the same time that they've been doing that, inflation has been coming down. And the market's belief is, and I'm trying to, you know, project the market here, that the neutral funds rate is coming down as well with lower inflation. And as the Fed raises rates, it believes that we actually might be very, very close to being neutral, if not at neutral right now. Now, if inflation heats up, that neutral funds rate goes back up. And if we are near neutral and the Fed is making more noise about raising rates more and reducing its balance sheet, which is another form of of, uh, raising rates, then the market's afraid that we're going to go off into tightening land where it's going to be hurtful for the economy, and that would be very supportive for the long end. The long end would tend to – 10-year yields would tend to fall and our prices rally if you believe that the economy was going to struggle – under the weight of high interest rates. And yes, the bond market is thinking that maybe one and a half or one and three quarters might be defined as high interest rates if inflation stays at these levels. Um, Jim, you've written before that the bond market and the Fed have very different outlooks on inflation. And in fact, you said the bond market's pricing in a much higher chance of, I think, one and a half percent inflation than two and a half percent inflation. You've also written that historically the Fed won't raise rates until the market's already priced it in because the Fed doesn't want to surprise the market. So with these two facts, the Fed and the bond market kind of on different sides of the the stream, what does that mean for the Fed's plans to continue raising rates and potentially shrink its balance sheet? Uh, You know, I go you one step further, too. Um, The Federal Reserve just last week had their meeting, and they put out their famous dot chart. And in it, they said they would raise rates one more time this year and three times next year. And the market is saying that there's maybe – a 50-50 chance of one more rate hike this year and only one rate hike next year. So when the Fed says that they've got four more rate hikes through the end of next year, the market is saying maybe one and a half is what you've got. And you're right. 
I think that, the, that whenever you see these divergences, and I would argue that the market's other divergences is that it is not uh, thinking that inflation is going to rebound as much as uh, Chair Yellen said last week, that the market usually wins on that case. And I've got a, a great antidote for you on this one. So this is about four years ago. I was at the Chicago uh, Federal Reserve, and I was in a meeting with about a dozen people with Charlie Evans. And Charlie, was make, and Charlie Evans is president of Chicago Fed, and he was making some kind of a, a comment on something, and I forgot what it was, but I said to him, oh, you mean like when Bernanke said subprime was contained? And he looked at me and he said, oh, but it was. Un, until you guys, pointing at me, you guys, I was the metaphor for the financial markets, until you guys panicked. And then I realized later that day what he was saying. The Fed can fix every problem, but what they worry about more than anything else is those cretins in the financial market go off half-cocked in a panic and create a problem where none exists. So they worry about financial markets almost obsessively. They think they can fix everything, but what they cannot fix is unbridled panic in the financial markets that will take a non-problem and make it a problem. That's their viewpoint. Very... Uh, you know, a conceited viewpoint that they have of the world, that they can fix everything if those, you know, if those lower brainstem people in the financial markets would stop messing it all up is where they are right now. So I think that at the end of the day, whenever there's this divergence, the Fed would like to do this, the market price is in that, they c continually cave to the market's wishes be precisely because they don't want to see some kind of a panic set in and then have to deal with that. Uh, Jim, it sounds like you're saying that um, the Fed's not a fan of grants. Yeah, <laughs> you might want to say that. Um, I, I would actually go you one step further. I don't think the Fed's a, a fan of financial markets. I think that they think that financial markets more get in the way than anything else. They don't view them, they don't view financial markets as uh, price discovery mechanisms. If they did, they would never engage in the type of manipulation they were doing because they would understand that that manipulation means that they're muddying the price discovery pro process of markets and that they don't know what is true or what isn't true. So, yeah, they might not be a fan of grants, but I think it goes much more beyond that. Uh, just going back to Evans for a second, uh, on Monday this week, he came out and it seems like he discovered Amazon.com for the first time and the fact that Amazon leads to, to price deflation. And he said it may cause inflation to undershoot its uh, the Fed's 2% bogey. Now, we've argued that deflation is not always a bad thing. And in the last quarter of the 19th century, we had falling prices and rising uh, you know, living standards. Do you think the Fed's reappraising its inflation target or was that just kind of idle talk? Well, I think that it, you're right. I think that Evans finally figured out that those malls down the street from his house that are closing and those Amazon boxes that are stacked up on his uh, front store uh, stoop, they're actually related to each other. He finally kind of figured that out a little bit. Uh, but now that I've kind of teased him a little bit, I'll say one thing in, in, all, uh, in all seriousness. I think he is right that technology is bringing about lower inflation and maybe deflation. But what your question suggested is correct, too. The Fed doesn't think that there's anything good about low inflation or deflation. They don't think that anything good comes of it. They think it's all bad. And I think it's because their viewpoint is, if you look at the flow of fund statistics through the end of the first quarter, there's about $70 trillion, with a T, dollars of debt priced in U.S. dollars worldwide. And that zero to negative def uh, inflation, or what we would call deflation, puts the prepayment of a lot of that debt at risk. That's why they have a 2% target on inflation, and they believe that the scourge is lower inflation to deflation, even though I agree with you that there can be a good deflation and that there can be um, nothing wrong with falling prices. We've seen that for the last 20 years in the technology sector. Jim, this is uh, Jim Grant. Do you know that from something you've heard, that is the Fed's view, or do you surmise it? I, I think I'd more surmise it from the way that they, yeah. they, they talk. You know, the Fed officials are very close to the vest these days um, after that uh, Medley uh, case in 2012. You know, whenever you try to talk to them, there has to be certain people in the room, and they're very measured with their talk. 
So it's very hard to get any real information out of them. So you have to surmise a lot of this stuff. Yeah. You know, um, this business about this, uh, about defla- so-called deflation, uh, this preoccupation to the point of obsession with the 1930s as interpreted by, you know, approved historians. Uh, there were 12 consecutive months of year-over-year declines in the CPI between uh, mid-1955 and 1956, and there was, I think, not one single news story about this uh, this blight of falling prices in America. It just it went without notice. It was after the Korean War, and, and there was less defense spending, and uh, I've forgotten the details beyond that, but there seems to be a kind of a deflationary hypochondria today that... Uh, would be of passing interest if that, except for the fact that it seems to inform Fed policy. To the extent that it does inform Fed policy, it's a, it's a problem, no? Oh, yeah, I would agree. Just a, a quick postscript. Yeah, in 1955-56, the last time that we had a negative CPI, the federal debt to GDP level was well less than half of current levels. So when we were had falling prices, there was not this fear of over of an over leveraged economy having to pay back, um, you know, unsustainable levels of debt as well too. So that's probably one of the reasons that back then it wasn't a concern versus a concern now. I'm trying to, you know, make the the, the Fed's argument as well. The problem with this obsession with 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 inflation and that we have to continue with inflation is the Fed is also in the belief that we should continue to have more debt and we should continue to have more of this. This is why their their retort at every, you know, uh, testimony that Chair Yellen gives or Bernanke before her is we've done all we can. We need fiscal policy to, to step up and do more. And that sounds to me a lot like we need more, you know, borrowing and spending. We need more, you know, uh, uh, WPA pro- types of projects for the 21st century, which, uh, uh, which is kind of what we had with the stimulus package in 2009. Well, you know, it's, it's, so, it's, it's very, it, it, if you listen to um, the well-argued uh, position of the Hoisington investment management people, Lacey Hunt and Van Hoisington, uh, their argument is as follows. The debt is a dead hand on production. Debt is deflationary, at least beyond a certain level of debt in relation to income uh, and, and capacity to service that debt. And we have passed that particular Rubicon. And that uh, the debt now, as it accretes, is, is deflationary. It is unproductive. And it is, uh, it's in good part the reason why uh, we are seeing uh, some of the problems we are seeing in the economy, like the evident, uh, the, not the evident, the, the lack of dynamism, the lack of the characteristic dynamism that uh, has, in, has been the characteristic of American enterprise for so long. Completely agree with that. And if you take that argument and you put it on steroids, you have the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago as well, too, that that, that, that over-leveraging and that debt problem that they have is in that case is just leading to a migration out of the city and out of the state as people don't want to stay here anymore because of those lack of opportunities and that lack of growth. They'll go other places as well. So I completely agree that while I'm explaining that the Fed is obsessed with this debt thing, it's not necessarily a good thing that they're, they're obsessed with it right yeah. now. Uh, this is Jim Grant, and with us today is Jim Bianco and, of course, Evan Lorenz, deputy editor of Grants, and we are talking about, I don't know, we're talking about uh, the world with respect to interest rates. Um, Jim, uh, how do you read the sentiment in the market with respect to bonds? Are people bullish, bearish? Confused, yes, probably confused, but uh, is is does the market want to own this stuff? Does it want to sell it? Yeah, let's let's divide that into two camps. If you were to ask people what is the long term view of interest rates, it's up. It's it and and they they've argued that it has been up for many years. Nassim Taleb in 2010 said every human should be short the 30-year bond. It's up 50% since he said that. In 2012, we've had arguments that have uh, from Leon Cooperman that said, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't buy bonds with your money. And, of course, they've rallied quite a bit uh, since that uh, statement as well, too. So on the long term, people all think that rates have nowhere to go but up. And they look at a 200-year chart and they go, wow, it's at the lowest levels or near the lowest levels in 200 years. It's kind of a a version of the Mike Milken story. It's only got one way to go, and it's got to go up. If if the answer is the more shorter-term 
level, like over the next few months or several months, we started the year in January with everybody believing that the Fed was going to raise rates and long-term rates were going to go up. We, we briefly hit about 260 on the 10-year note, and now we're at around 215. We're at a mixed level right now in terms of sentiment in the market. There are some bulls. There are some bears, but it's not clear. It's somewhere in the middle. As a contrarian, I love to look at the sentiment numbers, but only when everybody lines up one way do they really seem to work well. That was the case in January and February. Rates were The, the, the argument then was what's the date we're going to be at 3% in the 10-year? Not if, but what was the date we were going to be there? Now that we're at 215, that's been thrown into doubt. We haven't quite gone bullish yet, so... We're somewhere in the middle. If you look at kind of the speculative markets, like um, I guess commitments to traders for euro dollar futures, uh, is anybody in an extreme, or is it kind of just kind of a middling level in terms of where people are placing their bets right now? The euro dollar fu- commitment to traders, looking at the speculative positions, is at a big extreme short right now. But then offsetting that is that the uh, ten-year uh, futures, which is uh, tied to the ten-year bond, is at an extreme net long. So you've got that's what I mean by that. You've got these. Uh, mixed signals. You don't have them all one way or you don't have them uh, uh, another way as well, too. So uh, on the front end of the curve, the euro dollars, that extreme, that short, uh, is mainly in, in securities. The, the euro dollar is in, is, matures in the 90-day LIBOR, but it's mainly in securities that won't mature for another two, three, or four years is where, they, where, where a lot of that gets trafficked to. And then on the 10-year note, they're very, very long. So it's, it's not clear. It's kind of a mixed bag. Do you see any speculative opportunities, uh, excesses in one extreme or the other in other markets you follow, Jim? Yeah. The, um, the one market that we've been watching a lot has been in the energy space. Um, it, it, it's somewhat similar to the bond market. You know, back in January when we were in fifty-two, fifty-three dollars in WTI, the argument was, "What's the date we're going to see sixty? Not if we're going to see 60. Well, now that we're under forty-three dollars, uh, the the fear there is people are still thinking to themselves, "Wow, now I get more of a return when we go to sixty because I could buy it at forty-three instead of fifty-two." And I fear that the 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 glut problem in the energy market is not going to go away, and that there's still Everybody's natural instinct in energy is to buy it because it's going to go up. And I wouldn't be surprised if we continue to see that one um, start to head lower. I, I guess the flip side of that is when we look at kind of the fundamentals, um, discoveries outside of um, OPEC have been in the lowest levels in 50 plus years for the last two years running. And at current prices, we're just not seeing anybody put new money into exploration. And it seems like after this year, we're going to start seeing declines in non US, non OPEC production which should lead to a pretty decent balance, uh, I mean, if demand is still growing. Uh, except in the U.S. Uh, the, uh, the big swing producer right now is the wildcatters and the frackers. Uh, we have a record number of drilled but uncompleted wells, otherwise known as ducks. Uh, that's what the rigs are. Rigs make wells, and we've made a number of these wells. We have had a, a big surge of technology in the energy space that a lot of these guys now believe that they can still turn a profit at the mid-30s and that they're going to continue to turn on their wells as much, too. The problem is once you get outside of the U.S., most of this uh, energy sector outside the U.S. is dominated by national oil companies. National oil companies are corrupt, mismanaged, and they're nowhere near being able to lower their break-evens uh, uh, production costs like, uh, like the U.S. can with technology. And they are going to continue to see their, them pull back. But the U.S. can continue to add to that pile, I think, and that this current situation is going to stick and that the next level, the next move lower is going to be prices. Hey, Jim Bianco, thank you so much for being with us from, uh, from the state of Illinois and to the uh, city of Chicago, to the yield curve, to, uh, to the corruption of certain unnamed oil companies. It's been terrific talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you once more for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Today's episode was brought to you by the nice folks at Pitney Bowes, the uh, makers of the Pitney Bowes Senpro. Look forward to the next time from Grant's Interest Rate Observer.